what's up hello my name is Emma and today I am giving you guys my review of Queen of Air and Darkness by Cassandra Clare. The final installment in the Dark Artifices series is here, it is out into the world, I have read it and finished it and loved it. Today I am giving you my full complete spoiler filled discussion on everything that went down in this book so in order to complete the video you will definitely want to go out and get your hands on the Dark Artifices series and then come back. What I can say without spoilers is that I adored Queen of Air and Darkness. It was such a satisfying conclusion in my opinion but it also like so is not the end because everything that happened in Queen of Air and Darkness is going to lead into the Wicked Power series so it just doesn't even feel like it's truly over which is awesome. So much of Queen of Air and Darkness was unexpected. I totally could not anticipate the many wildly different directions the story goes into and it really blew my mind in that manner. I said this in my reading vlog but I feel like Queen of Air and Darkness is more of a City of Heavenly Fire Cassie Clare conclusion compared to Clockwork Princess. This story was so exciting and complex and political. It was satisfying and heartbreaking and emotional and just everything I wanted and more. So now I'm going to head into my spoiler filled discussion where I talk about my likes, my dislikes, the connections I've made to other books and just all of my thoughts about it. So if you have not read Queen of Air and Darkness yet, I would totally recommend catching up on this series and coming back so we can discuss it together. But bye non-spoiler people. So Queen of Air and Darkness picks up literally minutes right after Lord of Shadows ends. We have Livy and Robert Lightwood who have recently been killed by Annabelle Blackthorn. The whole first chunk of this book is just consumed by grief and hopelessness and it was like a very very dark time for these shadow hunters and I just thought everything about this plotline was explored beautifully. It was so sad when Emma is like trying to find out what she can do to help and so she's like oh I can wash Livy's clothes but like there's no reason to wash Livy's clothes. And just the way that each Blackthorn's individual and unique grief is explored in this book is so well done. Like this could honestly just be a video on the themes of grief and loss in this book but it was just all so so wonderful. One of the very first things I picked up on was we have this moment between Emma and Julian that is a theme among Parabatai in the Shadowhunter Chronicles. We have Emma call out Julian, Julian is that you in the Dark Artifices series we have Jem call out Will, Will is that you and in the Mortal Instruments series we have Jace call out Alec, Alec is that you. And there's just something so genuine and loving that comes across in that question. It's just a very sweet parallel to connect all of these different generations of Parabatai. My prediction is that in the last hours it's going to be James saying Matthew, Matthew is that you, but I have no clue who is going to be like the main Parabatai couple in the Wicked Power, so I'm really curious to find that out. Another really cool parallel is when Julian seeks out Magnus and Magnus is like, I need your help, I'm here on my own account, there's no one else that I can ask. And it's like a different rainy night, a different blue haired boy, I just really appreciated that moment, but we will We'll talk about that in a second. So we have the big funeral at the very beginning of the story. Of course, it's incredibly sad, like I don't have to say this. Now I feel like this scene didn't have the same emotional punch for me because in the Queen of Air and Darkness chapter sampler, it's like the chapter after the funeral. So they're making references to it and talking about it. So for example, when Ty climbs Livy's pyre, I already knew he was going there to get the locket and like that was his main intention. So everyone else is like, oh my God, Ty climbed Livy's pyre and I'm like, yeah, Ty climbed Livy's pyre. I have to say, part of me is kind of regretting reading absolutely every snippet and sneak peek that was posted about Queen of Air and Darkness because I feel like a lot of the beginning of the book are things that I had already read and I just don't think I had the same impact if I was going into it completely fresh. What I will say about that scene is Michael Whalen's ghost appearing at Robert's funeral and putting his hand on Maris's shoulder. That was a hard moment. It was so unexpected and sweet, but it felt so necessary and it was almost like the scene would not have been complete without Michael's presence there. Kit's ability to see ghosts is just such a great addition to the story. It's a way to naturally incorporate past characters, but I also really like the fact that it is coming across through the perspective of someone who doesn't fully understand all of the Shadowhunter history and there's like some blanks that are left open that Kit doesn't know, but we as readers know, so it's a really fun 
experience to have while reading the series. Tessa is pregnant. I did already know this from reading Ghosts of the Shadow Market because that's when this plot line is really developed and you get all of the context behind it. But I'm so excited for them. Like, they deserve it so much. I can't believe how happy they're going to be together. Like, Jem is going to have his own children for the first time and he's going to be able to have like a full family with Tessa, which they've wanted for so long. And it is just so amazing. But I'm also so intrigued to learn more about their child. My prediction is the next time we're going to see Jem and Tessa's kid is going to be in the Wicked Powers and if they age normally. Listen, you never know. They will only be about two or three years old and if we're honest, there's not many roles for toddlers to play in the Shadowhunter Chronicles. So the fact that this child is being included at all makes me think that they're going to play a hugely unexpected role and it's just going to change the course of everything in the Wicked Powers. Like, there has to be some significant reason why we're getting introduced to this character who is not like a, an adult who can really interact with the story. I'm so curious and excited. Also, when Jem calls Emma May May, which is Mandarin for little sister, it was so, so sweet. Something I found to be very shocking in Queen of Very Darkness is how the younger Blackthorns reacted to Helen being back at the Los Angeles Institute. Because we've seen how much Julian and Mark miss Helen, I feel like all of us kind of unanimously agreed that like Helen being back was going to be such a happy thing and all of the Blackthorns were like finally going to have this tight, strong, completed family relationship and it wasn't like that. It's very awkward and strange and I think especially Drew's relationship with Helen was really, really interesting throughout the story. I found it so interesting that Drew sort of resented Helen and almost felt a little abandoned because she went off so happily for her travel year that Drew thought that she didn't miss her and then they believed that everything was all happy with Helen and Elaine when they were exiled and so she has a lot of these like deeply rooted feelings that get to be expressed and I thought it was really well done. I loved the moment of reconciliation between the two of them when Helen is like complimenting Drew about how she has such style and how she reminds them of their mom and how she promises that like she's not going to leave her again. It was a really sweet moment. But then of course it's a Cassie Clare book and like as soon as someone promises that they're not going to leave, I'm immediately like, that's it. They're going to die. They're never going to see each other again. Like this is a trick. So we got to talk about this spell, this spell that Magnus placed on Julian. First of all, hella pissed at Julian for going to Magnus when he's sick. Like, are you kidding me? Second of all, so selfish and wrong. Third, I was actually really surprised that Magnus went through with it and actually placed the spell on Julian to take away all of his emotions. Magnus is so old and so wise and has lived through so much and I feel like there is like no single character in the Shadowhunter Chronicles who would better understand the value of emotions and why they're so important to us and so it almost sort of felt a little out of character for Magnus to do like I, I don't understand fully why he agreed to it and like I know he regretted it later but still like I'm just shocked he would do it in the first place. Also, I'm so pissed off at Julian. Like, I was supposed to spend this whole book feeling bad for him and rooting for him and empathizing with him, but he went and did this and just started treating everyone around him so terribly that I was like, dude. <laughs> I just hate how he intentionally lies to Emma. Like the way that he apologized to her because he wanted to have sex with her and didn't actually feel bad. Like, I don't know if I'll ever work through that. I am forever going to have some unfinished business with Julian Blackthorn because of this spell. And also it made me feel so bad for Emma. It was so hard to have to sit there and read her trying to cope with the fact that Julian, not only the boy that she's in love with, but her parabatai, her family, is like here, but he's not here. And she like doesn't know how to feel about it. What I did like about the storyline though, is that it sort of reminded me of the situation between Jace and Clary in Lord of Shadows when Jace is being controlled by Sebastian. There are definitely differences though. Like for example, Julian is like actively deceiving his loved ones, whereas Jace is just sort of different and not himself. And I also feel like we view Jace as having less responsibility for what happened to him and the things that he did when he was under Sebastian's control because he was under Sebastian's control, whereas Julian willingly put himself in this situation and he chose this. 
On an unrelated note, I of course love Gwyn and Diana so much. I'm so happy they are together and I'm happy they are happy together. I feel like I've never shipped like a side couple so much in any book, but I just feel that they are so perfect for each other. I'm so in love with them being in love and I really hope we get to see more of them in the future. But there is one moment between them that like gave me pause and it's when, I don't remember exactly what point in the story it takes place at, but it's when um, Diana kisses Gwyn and when he goes away she realizes there's like ash on her fingertips. In the text it says she was like cupping Gwen's face so I don't know if like the ash was supposed to come off on her fingertips or if it's something completely unrelated but it just like wasn't explained so I'm curious if it's something that is going to be delved more into in the Wicked Powers. Because the last time a character came away with something dark on their fingertips after kissing someone, it turned out to be their evil brother, so I need to know what's going on. Another thing I wasn't expecting in Queen Mary Darkness is at the start of the story, Horace Dearborn knows that Emma and Julian are in love. Apparently he read Robert Lightwood's notes about the two of them, and like all I could think is, Robert Lightwood would not write this down. I could have understood it if like there was stuff about Parabatai's being in love like strewn across Robert Lightwood's office when Horace went in after his death and he like made connections and stuff but I'm like Robert Lightwood knows how serious it is to have two Parabatai fall in love and if he was intent on helping them obviously no one else could know so like I just don't think he would have written it down. It was way too convenient. I love that the reason that Clary and Jace's runes work in fairy is because they have this extra angel blood in them. I just love that this information that came from City of Glass is still being expanded upon and like given new pathways many many books and years down the line. I just I love Cassie Clare so much. Another Blackthorn perspective on Libby's death that I really enjoyed reading was Mark's. Mark talked about how when he was in the wild hunt and believed that his entire family was dead he had already grieved for Libby but then he got her back and lost her again so his grief is totally different from any of the rest of the Blackthorns and I just found that so interesting and thought-provoking. So in the beginning of the book, really like still in the beginning of the book, we have this Mark Tina moment where like they're like about to have sex and we're all hyped as hell. But Mark says he doesn't have a steel so he can't put the birth control rune on Christina and they don't have protection so they like do other things. But Mark lied and had his steal the whole time. That frustrated me so much. Like, why can't Cassie Clear characters be honest? Like, they always make more problems for themselves. And it's like, just be honest and communicate and so much less shit would happen in your life. Okay, not like the demons and necromancy and stuff, but like, the interpersonal problems could so easily be resolved if you were just honest. So I've had a complex relationship with Kieran across this series. When I first read Lady Midnight, I just absolutely despised him. I thought he was the absolute worst. He was on like Zara level. I read Lord of Shadows and I'm like, hmm, you know what? Maybe he's not so bad. Like, I don't totally love him, but maybe like my my past grievances aren't as important. And so now after finishing Queen of Air and Darkness, I've realized that it's not that I, I don't like Kieran. I just don't personally care for him the way that other people do. I finally recognize that I feel like I like Kieran better as a part of like a relationship between him, Mark, and Christina than I like him as an individual character. Though I don't love Kieran, I do feel like he has a very satisfying redemption arc and like in my eyes he's totally forgiven by the end of Queen of Air and Darkness. A moment that really stands out to me is when he's at the Skullamance and Samantha is like drowning in the pool that lets him see everything bad they've ever done and Kieran is like coughing up blood after being tortured by her and he still sends out his hand to try and help her. He didn't do that for any personal gain. He did it because that was the right thing to do and I feel like that was just the moment where I like really saw Kieran's true character and even though he's made mistakes that I don't agree with like the person that he is now is really admirable in my opinion. And also the way that the people of Fairy talk about Kieran like really warmed my heart. It was very sweet. So like Kieran not my fave but a really good character, I will say. I love how much Helen and Aline we have in this book. I feel like we just like have not gotten enough of them and Queen of Air Darkness really fulfilled what I wanted to see from their relationship and made me 
fall in love with them so much. I loved the moment where Aileen stands up for Helen to the rest of the Blackthorn kids and is like, you are not going to make my wife cry. You're gonna eat your oatmeal and you're gonna like it. Aileen especially has this very distinct personality. She's super abrasive and strong and just like does not take anyone's shit, which I love. But I feel like we have not been able to see that really shine through at all since we first met her in City of Glass. I adore Aileen so much and I'm so incredibly excited to see more of the two of them together in the Eldest Curses series with Alec and Magnus. It's gonna be a great time. A very shocking moment for me is when Julian kills Dane Larkspear. I know that Dane was sent there to kill Emma and Julian and he would not have hesitated and he also is so clearly a horrible, horrible person who deserved to die. But it's the fact that Julian like almost killed him in cold blood and it was a very personal kill because of the way that Dane insulted Livy and it wasn't necessarily about all the bad stuff he had done or was planning to do to them. Shadowhunters killing Shadowhunters is such a big deal. Like that is the whole reason why the Dark Army was so intimidating and such a threat because they were fighting their own people even if they had been transformed into something different. Now we know from Lord of Shadows that the way to stop the Parabatai curse from consuming Emma and Julian is to destroy all Parabatai bonds. But in this book, we find out from the Sealy Queen that the way to do that is to destroy the very first Parabatai rune created by Jonathan Shadowhunter and his Parabatai. I like did not know that the Parabatai bond was not created by the Angel Raziel and was created by Jonathan Shadowhunter. So it's like a man-made rune and that's why it has this bizarre curse. I thought that was so interesting. Even as this plot was unfurling, I feel like a lot of the fandom was just like, I don't understand why this happens. Like, why can't Parabatai fall in love? Why does this bad thing happen if they do? And I just, I think the resolution makes so much sense to me. The fact that it's a man-made rune, I thought it was excellent. And I just thought all throughout this conclusion, like the information about the Nephilim history and the first Nephilim, it was a very, very enticing angle. And I really enjoyed getting to learn more about it. I hope that in future Cassie Clara books that we can also get some more history behind it because it was really fascinating to me. So Mark, Kieran, and Christina, they have the wildest, wildest storyline in my opinion. I just loved the moment where Mark tells Kieran that him and Christina were together when he was at the Skullamance and Kieran says like, I had hoped you would be, that thought brings me joy. Ah, oh, they're so sweet. And the hot fairy threesome happened and it was amazing. I just love the three of them together so much. They have such a fantastic dynamic and relationship. The three of them ending up together is so clearly not just like a cop out resolution to this love triangle, but is something that has been building for so long and it just felt so good for the three of them to just finally acknowledge their feelings and to be unapologetically in love with each other. The one thing I will say though is their bond together is just so strong and every moment they have together is just so incredibly intimate that like I feel like I shouldn't be watching. I feel like it's a private moment and like I shouldn't be reading this. Near the end of Clockwork Princess and like the succeeding stories about Will, Gem, and Tessa too, like there is just some like otherworldly love going on that I don't understand and I feel like it's wrong for me to watch. So we get a little bit more development on the story of Jaime and Drew as Jaime has found out that Drew is 13 and not 16 and is rightfully taken aback when he finds out. Listen, I don't know what's going on between Jaime and Drew. They have this dynamic where it's like a really cute friendship of like an older person and a younger person and they have like something very innocent going on but there is also like this weird like flirtatious attraction kind of thing that's going on like Drew obviously has been crushing on Jaime a little bit but he also I feel like has some like unfinished feelings for her I just can't figure out if Cassie has been setting it up for Jaime to be an actual love interest of Drew and for them to be together or if they're just supposed to have this innocent friendship. See, I like them together as friends, but I also am intrigued by the idea of exploring romantic feelings for each other, but also their age gap does make me a little hesitant. <laughs> like I know everything would be legal and fine in the Wicked Powers when Drew is 17 and Jaime is 20, but the fact that they had this like 
secret relationship, secret friendship when Drew was 13 and Jaime was 16. Um, and them reverting to that when Drew is older just like kind of sets me off a bit. I love this really sweet quote from Kit about Ty where he says, it was one of the greatest things about Ty. He made you consider the threads of subconscious logic that wove beneath the surface of ordinary conversations. The way Kit feels about Ty is just so adorable. He notices the most simple things about this boy and takes appreciation in every ounce of it and I just love them together so much. Something else I find really interesting about their relationship is in Lord of Shadows, Ty is really the one that's pursuing a friendship with Kit. You know, Kit really wants his space. He doesn't want anything to have to do with the Shadowhunter world. He's going through a lot, but it's Ty's persistence that really opens him up to this part of himself and that's really where the relationship starts. Whereas in Queen of Air and Darkness, I feel like Kit is really the one that's chasing Ty a little bit more because Ty is so preoccupied occupied with bringing back Livy that he I feel like he doesn't pay a ton of attention to Kit as much as he did in Lord of Shadows so I think it's really interesting to see Kit as being the one who's like I want a friendship with this person I want to grow closer with them and that really sets up for why the ending of them is so devastating. I feel like one of the most terrible terrible moments of Queen of Our Darkness is when Horace Dearborn is given his whole make Shadowhunter strong again speech and he brings out the corpse of Dane the Larkspear to show to everyone of what happened to him when he was in fairy. And like the worst part of it is that is how Dane's family finds out that he's dead by seeing his corpse in front of everyone with no preparation whatsoever. What Horace did was just such a heinous, morally obsolete act without inciting violence against anyone specifically in that moment that like I was really taken aback. You know, I spent a large chunk of this book just like laughing at Horace. I think he's just so ridiculous in the manner that he goes about things that it's almost unrealistic that he's like this bad. But in that moment I had to just like pause and I was like, oh, no, no, he's like terrible too. He's not just like ridiculously bad. He's actually bad. I love Ash so much. I don't know what his whole deal is with this like unwavering loyalty power he has, but it has transcended the page because I want to protect him with my life. I'm so obsessed with Ash, like it's a little concerning. I was so happy when we found out and were confirmed that he is the child of Sebastian Morgenstern and the Seelie Queen. If anyone watched my reading vlog and noted the moment where I screened twice on one page, it was when we found out that Ash was the child of Sebastian and the Seelie Queen. Like Ash is so ridiculously powerful. He has Shadowhunter blood, fairy blood, and greater demon blood inside of him. Like, I, I, I can't even see where his character is going to go. In that scene, we also find out that Ash is the weapon that the Seely King has been using to spread the blight in Idris. I found this really interesting because while I did predict that Ash would be the child of Sebastian the Seely Queen and that he is the weapon that the Unseely King had that Clary and Juice were looking for, but I just didn't expect it to have anything to do with the blight. And I thought that was a really cool twist. Speaking of the blight, Horace Dearborn has teamed up with the Unseely King to bring the blight into Idris. Like this was planned. It's a conspiracy. No, it's not a conspiracy because it's true. Their whole like weird alliance to like block off fairy just like really took me off guard. It almost reminded me of how Valentine was using the Mortal Cup to control demons earlier on in the Mortal Instruments series. But again, it's way more severe than that because like this is like a conscious political decision that these two rulers made. A great moment of comic relief is when the cohort forces all institutes to start registering their local downworlders and Helen and Eileen retaliate by giving them fake names. I really enjoyed that moment. We find out that the first heir is not only the child of the Unseelie King, but also of the Unseelie Queen. And this child was created to have power over both courts. We find out the king actually tried to kill Oraline because he didn't want a daughter and made up this whole rumor about her being kidnapped. And we also find out that when Oraline escaped, she grew up to marry someone off of Tobias Herendel's line. And many, many descendants later, we have Kit's mother named Rosemary, aka Kit is a descendant of the first heir and has claim to both the Seely and Unseely court. I love this subplot so much. I thought it was so fascinating how it was wound between the history that we already know. I think it's so interesting that Kit has these like 
wild magical powers that we don't fully understand yet and I'm really excited to see how things are explored in the wicked powers with him and his heritage. Also shout out to Diana for literally cutting off Horace Dearborn's arm and jumping out the fucking window. That was amazing. Something I really appreciated in Queen of Air and Darkness is the fight scenes. I thought that the fight scene at the Silly Court and at the very end were some of the greatest fight scenes I've ever seen from Cassie Clare. I love a battle that is super well choreographed, like the momentum of the scene is captured so visually and it's easy to see. I like having like little snippets of what's happening between each person who's battling each other and because like so much is revealed in those scenes too, it's not just fighting. Um, so I just thought all the fight scenes, especially those two were really, really good. Now we have to talk about Thule. So we have Thule, which is this alternate dimension where Sebastian never died, Jason Him won the battle at the Buren, and the world has proceeded as such. I will say, the alternative dimension thing is always a little cheesy. It is like so, so hard to break out of just the overall campiness of this plotline whenever it appears, and Queen of Mary Darkness was no exception. I feel like Thule relied a little bit too heavily on nostalgia because personally, like y'all know, I'm a huge fan of the Mortal Instruments series. I was obviously really hyped for this, but I of course was more interested in the moments that had to do with like the past characters and what's become of them as opposed to like having this actual storyline of Emma and Julian being with Livy again. So yeah, it wasn't a direction I was expecting at all. Um, I don't think it is like the most innovative or creative approach to taking this story, but like a bitch loved every second of it. So if this isn't the first video you've ever watched of mine, you have to know that I lost my shit when we found out that Sebastian was still alive. The moment we found that out was probably like the most stressful reading experience I have ever had in my entire life. Basically, I was reading at work and I'm not supposed to read when my manager is there. So like the line, like the literal sentence where it says that Sebastian is walking alongside all of these in Darkened, my manager walks in the door and I have to shut the book. I could not pick up that book for at least another two hours. It was excruciating to know that Sebastian was alive and in power and I couldn't read anything about it. And also Jace like still being controlled by Sebastian was mind blowing to me. Like even if you could have predicted that Sebastian was coming back, like I don't think anyone would have expected us to revert back to this Jace who's completely under his control and is on his side. A lot has changed. Um, Clary died at the Battle of the Buren and we find out that like all of the visions Clary has been having about her dying and the reason she rejected Jace's proposal weren't because she was dying in real life, she was dying in the Thule dimension. I feel like every once in a while in a Cassie Clare book, we get like a lot of hype around something that's going on and I feel like it sometimes ends up being like this silly thing that like was not as big of a deal as everyone else was expecting. Like we have all these visions from Clary and we're all freaking out that she's gonna die in Queen of Air and Darkness and like, oh, it wasn't like actually real. <laughs> I found it so cool that Livy was alive in Thule. I really expected her to only come back as a ghost in this book, but having her be like a, a, a total corporeal being and have all of the experiences was really, really interesting. The plot line about Alec and Magnus just absolutely broke me. The warlock sickness turns them into demons and when Magnus starts turning, he asks Alec to kill him and so Alec kills himself because he can't live with what he's done. Oh my god. Raphael is also alive in Thule too, which I found so interesting. I, I never would have expected Raphael to come back. And so it was really cool to see him and his snarky self again. I love, I love that he hates that Magnus and Alec named their child after him. It is so freaking funny. And although there's like a lot of turmoil that goes on in Thule, there's three good things that come out of it. The spell on Julian breaks, so he's Finally, back to his normal self. We find out the cure for the warlock sickness is the water from Lake Lynn, which I also thought was a really cool revelation. And we get the mortal sword back, which is really important. Ooh, also around the end of Thule, when first, Jace kills Maris. The only note I have for this point is we're all fucked. I guess after Clary died, Thule Jace like really went off the deep end and transformed into a completely different true villainous character. So like if he is in our world and this Jace can kill Maris, like, like, 
We are so in trouble. We also get more insight into what happened with Julian and Anselm Nightshade in Lady Midnight when it seemed as if he basically threw Anselm Nightshade under the bus to protect his family and like the whole fandom was freaking out about it. Apparently that whole ordeal was set up not just to stop the Inquisitor from finding out about Arthur's condition, but because Cameron Ashdown had told Julian that Anselm was killing werewolf children, but they didn't have any permission from the Clave to search his house, so Julian got them permission. Throughout the series, people have just loved to talk about how dark Julian was gonna get and what a villain he is, and I'm like, He's just a really good anti-hero. <laughs> One moment I loved is when Sebastian was confronting Emma and Julian because he knows that they aren't his and Darkened. And so Emma is telling Sebastian about how he died in their world and how Clary cried over him. And Ash ends up killing Sebastian because this is Ash from our world. And he says he did it because he liked what Emma said about Clary. I need so much content of Clary and Ash having cute aunt and nephew moments. I need it so badly. So yes, Thule, the premise of itself is always cheesy and it's not the most unique take on a story I've ever seen, but I loved it because I had so much fun with it and I thought it was really, really amusing and gave me a lot of emotions, but also like it does come back full circle and there are things that are learned in Thule that are applied to the present story, which was great. So we finally find out who Shade is as throughout the story, he's been sort of like guiding Kid and Ty through this ceremony to bring back Livy. We find out that he is actually Ragnar Fell who did not die in City of Glass. I don't know about you, but I'm just like, we been new. <laughs> that said, I am extremely intrigued to find out like, how? <laughs> how was Ragnar still alive? Did he fake his own death? Was it intentional? What has he been doing for the last five years? And like, did anyone know? Or was he just like chilling by himself? <sighs> so we finally get to see what is in this note that Thule Livy has written to Ty. And it is just the sweetest note. Like, I said in my reading vlog, I did not cry at all during Queen of Hair and Darkness, very surprisingly, but one of the moments I came really, really close was this letter, which I just reread over and over and over again because I was so touched by it. I was like, that letter is like the shining light we need in this moment. Ty is finally going to drop this whole necromancy plot and he's going to realize that like he needs to grieve and really deal with it, but no, no, Ty only views this letter as the object from another dimension that they need to bring back Libby. What a fucking plot twist, honestly. I was so, so surprised when Ty had that reaction. He was just like, nope, we can use this. That's good, let's move on. You know, I really love the twist of fate where these shadow hunters and the clave primarily have been like pushing this agenda against fairies about how they're so terrible and how they all deserve to be punished for what happened in the dark war. But in Queen of Air and Darkness, the head of the clave is creating way more destruction for shadow hunters by destroying their holy land and getting the warlock sick. And the fairies are the ones to get the water from Lake Lynn and stop it all. You know, I really hope the Wicked Powers is like finally the Shadowhunter series where downworlders are respected and viewed as equal members of society because I'm just getting really tired of all of these racist Shadowhunters controlling the narrative for hundreds and hundreds of years and that's why I'm a liberal. I really loved this moment of development for Emma Julian and Mark's relationship because Mark is talking about how when he was in the wild hunt even though he was gone for like five years in their time he still is the same age when he came back and he feels like being the same age of them has allowed them to be more friends as opposed to him acting as an older brother for them. I thought that was so sweet. Like Mark just took this horrible experience, these years and years of torture and misery that he felt and turned it into a positive thing because it technically did bring him closer to his family and allow them to have a different relationship because the dynamic between them would be so different if Mark was in his 20s. So I just really, really loved seeing that. It just like warmed my heart. Back to talking about Kid and Ty. We have this one moment. I honestly don't even remember what scene it was because like it's just this moment that I specifically remember when they're like all toasting or something and Kit says to Ty to never being separated. And in that moment, I was like, 
This is foreshadowing. They're gonna be separated by the end. They're not going to start the Wicked Powers together as friends. I'm gonna lose my mind. This is a fan theory that I had heard about online before Queen of Air and Darkness, and it was in my mind throughout this whole book. The more I thought about it, the more I was like, huh, this would be like a really interesting avenue to start off the new series. But in that moment, I was literally just like, fuck. Like, this is really happening. They're absolutely gonna be separated at the end, and I'm so not ready for it and I wasn't ready for it. So finally, Ty and Kit have gathered everything they need to bring Livy back from the dead, and so Ty goes through with it, Livy appears, they talk, and she did not come back as a normal shadow hunter, but her ghost is forever tied to Ty as a result. Now, first of all, <laughs> this scene was heartbreaking. This was another really difficult scene. Like, just the image of Ty just like screaming for Livy because like he feels like this was his last chance and he's never going to see her again. So like the realization that she's gone really sets in. Oh, my baby, he didn't deserve it. Now, I never thought that Libby was actually going to come back, but of course that scene is super, super heartbreaking. Though, by the end of the story, after realizing, like, how Ty and Livy are now tied together, I realized it's pretty cool because we're gonna see more of Livy in the Wicked Powers, which is unexpected and awesome. And another moment that really hurt when Ty was bringing Livy back is when he says, there's nothing if you aren't here. And Kit takes that very personally to mean that Ty doesn't appreciate him and isn't really his friend. Now, I'm gonna say something that might be controversial. But while I like really feel for Kit and his insecurities in this moment, because honestly, I would probably react the same way and take it personally, but like, it's not about you. I think this whole thing is just a big misunderstanding. And like, part of me kind of hates the fact that this really brilliant plot line of Ty and Kit being separated is like, formed and founded on the fact that like Ty and Kit won't communicate. But it's like Ty and Livy have been together their entire lives and beyond that, having a twin is like such a different level of relationship. Ty and Kit have known each other for what, like a few months? Ty is obviously going to feel broken and alone and incomplete without Livy here, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't actually appreciate the other people that are in his life. He's grieving and he's allowed to do that. Like, no, Ty doesn't have the right to hurt other people just because he's grieving, but like, it's so clear to me that that's not what Ty meant by that statement, and if Kit had just confronted him about it, they would be fine and Kit wouldn't be going off to live with Gem and Tessa without at least saying goodbye to Ty. I'm mad. I really cannot believe how long this review is. <laughs> so we have this great scene where Emma almost ends all Parabatai bonds. I loved this scene so much. It was just such a moment full of tension and not knowing what was going to happen next. I also love it because I feel like the entire fandom had assumed that if anyone was going to end all Parabatai bonds, it would be Julian because we've seen from him that he's okay with throwing other people underneath him if it's to protect his loved ones, but it's Emma. Honestly, I just felt like drunk while reading that scene. I was just like so overtaken by emotions and like later in the book Emma talks about how like consumed she was by the curse in that moment and that's why everything turned out the way it did and like I sort of felt like I was consumed by it too. It was a really really wonderful reading experience. So we have this moment where Julian sees Annabelle and we're like oh my god this is the moment Julian is gonna kill Annabelle. He's going to get her back for killing Livy. Like this is what we've been waiting for. And we find out that it's not actually Annabelle. It's an Eidolon demon but a Seraphle does not work and like the Eidolon demon is not even affected. And it's just like what on earth? Like we know that Seraphles are like the one thing that always get demons and it's not working now. It's never explained. We never get any more information other than this scene, so I guess it's something to explore in the Wicked Powers, but I'm so confused. I'd be really intrigued to find out if it has anything to do with Tessa and her father, because we still don't know who Tessa's father is, but we are definitely going to find it out within the next two series, so I'd be really interested to know if something about this particular Eidolon demon and the fact that, like, Seraphlades aren't working against it have something to do with that reveal when it comes. So when Emma and Zara are battling for, like, the last time, like, not the time when Emma was so kind to spare this horrible person, but the second time, I was entirely convinced that Emma had died. Like, I was reading that scene and I was just like, oh my god, Cassie Clare 
really just killed off Emma Carstairs. But as it turns out, things just get even more wild than if Emma died, in my opinion. Where Julian uses whatever the Parabatide curse magic stuff to heal her, and then they just start to burn. And then, beyond them burning, they turn into these gigantic figures that are like the first Nephilim that ever existed, and they're just burning with heavenly fire. It was so confusing to start, but I thought it was a really fascinating route. It reminded me a lot of Tessa transforming into the Clockwork Angel, and so I just thought it was super unexpected. I really loved it. And when I really started losing my mind, like beyond all of the mind loss that has happened before this, um, when like everything is cooled down, Horus is dead, there's no more battle, and Helen is trying to stop Emma and Julian, but they don't stop. I was so scared in that moment. Like there were some moments that really, really got me early on in the book, but from the point where Emma is stabbed by Zara and I think she's dead to like that moment, I'm like, oh my God. I was genuinely scared at that moment. Like I had no idea what was gonna happen because they were clearly not Emma and Julian anymore. And it was a wild time. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't think the resolution was as good as the setup. I feel like it should have been way more impactful. I was really underwhelmed, like, when all of the Blackthorns were getting together and were like, we have to convince them that they're still loved and they're still inside of there and we have to be the ones to bring them down because we're their family. I was like, no, no, not the love saves all trope. I feel I just needed more conflict as a result of Emma and Julian turning into the first Nephilim. Like it either needed to be harder to get them to change back to normal or there had to be more consequences if they were just magically saved by love. Not even like they turned back and like they just survived. Like that alone would have been a really big win for the both of them. But like they're also not Parabatai anymore, which I'm happy about. I'm so incredibly pleased that Emma and Julian can finally be together. No more secrets, no more pain no more curses happening and affecting their relationship like they're really going to finally start a new life together and I'm so excited about it it's so frustrating because like yes I'm satisfied this is absolutely what I wanted to happen but the masochistic part of me really wants to know what would have happened if like they would have died or if they would have stayed Parabatai and how things would have ended. I feel like I would just really love like an alternate ending to Queen of Air and Darkness, not to necessarily replace this one, but I just, I really want to know how things would have turned out otherwise. So Kieran becomes the king of the Unsealy Court because he killed his father. I saw that coming for a while during this book, but the moment that really changed things for me were when we found out that Kieran as a fairy king can't have mortal consorts and also he's not able to spend long times in the mortal world without being weekend so like there was no possible way for the three of them to be together. I was like, no, you can't create this extremely powerful bond between three people and then separate them. I was not having it. So naturally I'm elated at this romantic sex cottage they have where they can all be together and there's no consequences from anyone, even though Mark, Christine, and Kieran are all in different places at the end of Queen of Air and Darkness, they have a space where they can be together and I think that is so beautiful and I'm so excited. Kieran, Mark, and Christina was not my favorite love triangle and none of them individually were my favorite favorite couples out of the series, but the three of them together has like risen to the top of some of my biggest OTPs. I adore them together. So after all the chaos, Jem and Tessa invite Kit to come live with them as he's a Herondale and Tessa was once a Herondale. And honestly, if he had said goodbye to Ty and the Blackthorns, I probably would have been okay with it. Like I love the thought of Kit growing up in a household of people who love him, who are his actual family. And I think it would have been so good for him, but like the fact that he leaves without saying goodbye to anyone is so incredibly, I don't even know what word I'm trying to get across here, but I have a lot of feelings and I'm mad and upset and disappointed and scared and I just want Kit and Ty to be happy together forever. So after Kit has left, Ty decides to go to the Skolomance after all. Emma and Julian are going off on their travel year. Christina is going back to Mexico. Mark is going to New York to help run the Shadowhunter Downworlder Alliance. Helen and Eileen are running the New York Institute and Drew is potentially going to the Shadowhunter Academy. So there's really nothing holding him back here anymore because everyone is doing their own thing. So he decides to pursue the Skolomance. Like Kit, I'm happy for him. I'm excited that he gets to do his own thing. I think it'll be really good for him. I love how when Emma wakes up, she's afraid things between her and Julian are going to be awkward because they're no longer Parabatai anymore. And even though like they can finally like be in love and be together, this part of them that's been present in their relationship for so many years has been taken away. This line where Emma thinks, what if everything that had happened was so devastating that they could never reach a place of normalcy? It really reminds 
reminds me of the end of City of Glass where Clary is afraid that Jace won't want her anymore because Aileen placed the thought in her head that Jace only wanted it because it was forbidden. So Alec Lightwood becomes Consul. Again, this is another thing I saw coming from a mile away, but I'm so, so happy about it. Alec is going to make an absolutely amazing Consul. The one thing that made me side-eye this scene a little bit is how they placed all of this importance on making sure that every Shadowhunter gets a vote no matter how young and all of their voices are going to be heard. But I'm just like, even though they said the guard was more packed than Emma had ever seen it, like, does that mean that every single shadow hunter in the world is in Alicante at the moment? Like, I'm pretty sure at least some of them are still stationed all over the world and I don't think they got a vote because of how quickly it went, but maybe I'm just nitpicking. And then we get to like the big ending, like the big twist. You literally could predict anything that happened in this book except for the fact that the children of the cohort do not accept this new route the clave is going to take. So they threaten to kill themselves unless all shadow hunters leave Alicante and they basically bar themselves from the rest of the world. Amelia dies of suicide to prove that they aren't bluffing and I think it's Zara who says, can you build your new clave on the blood of dead children? Like, I cannot believe this is happening. My brain can't process the route that things took. This was such a bold choice for Cassie Clare to make, literally transforming the entire function of this government system she has set up for like, 16 books and like this change isn't a result of like a war or an evil person coming to power It is resolved so peacefully by them just leaving because these kids are threatening to end their own lives I'm in awe. Cassie Clare is just so amazing She knows how to end a book and how to leave things off for more development in the future. I'm so impressed It was a fabulous fabulous ending. I'm so, so pleased and I cannot wait to see how things play out in the future books. Of course, it's a Cassie Clare conclusion, so we have to end off with a wedding and I was so surprised to find out that it was Alec and Magnus getting married. It was just so beautiful and perfect. I love that they got to be married in their own colors and the way that like things were just like already set up before Magnus had even said yes. Alex's speech was just so beautiful and the fact that like their kids were there and everyone was there. How Jace walks Alec down the aisle and Katarina and Ragnar both walk Magnus down. Everything about that scene was so precious and perfect. And of course, I loved the final short story between Jace and Clary. I love that they go back to the greenhouse where they kissed for the first time and Clary has set up this whole like little picnic for Jace to propose to him. And she proposes to him with a sword in Latin. It was the most perfect thing that has ever happened in my entire life. I love them so much. I'm so happy they're getting married. They just, they deserve so much happiness and I'm so happy that things are working out for them and I will lose my mind if anything bad happens to them both in the Wicked Powers. It was a wonderful, wonderful last story. The final thing we have to talk about is this epilogue. This short ass epilogue. This epilogue is like five pages long. It's so short, but it shifts the course of the story for these Shadowhunters even further beyond what has already happened with the cohort and Alicante and whatnot. It starts off from the perspective of the Seely Queen and then all of a sudden, Jace walks in and we're like, what on earth is Jace doing with the Seely Queen? And like a few lines before it was revealed, I caught on to what was happening and realized that it was Thule Jace escaped from Thule and not our Jace. He is alive, he survived, and he's here in our world and he is bringing Ash to exchange the Seely Queen for Clary. Now listen, I cannot be more excited for the last hours. I'm so, so hyped for this series. I love these characters all so much already, but like, I don't know how to survive these next few years without the wicked powers because I need to know what happens with Duel Jace. There's a, there's nothing else to say. <laughs> like I really, I can't even find the words to express like, how much stuff is gonna go down once we get into the Wicked Powers with everything that has happened with the cohort and now Thule Jace. Shit's gonna get wild. I'm hyped. That concludes my review of Queen of Air and Darkness by Cassandra Clare. I had an amazing time reading this amazing final installment and I had a great time discussing and just gushing about everything with you guys. So please let me know your thoughts on Queen of Air and Darkness in the comments below. I can't wait to chat about it with you. But that is it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you soon for a new one. Bye! Oh,